Uh, hello, everyone. This was, without a doubt, the most time-consuming, arduous, difficult project I've ever completed in my entire life, but also perhaps the most rewarding and important accomplishment I've ever made. The resolution of this map was around 500% larger than that of my previous map, meaning that for every pixel on the last map, there were 5 pixels for this one, but I guarantee you it took much longer than 5 times as long to finish. Here's a comparison of my 2018 map for South America, with the same color scheme and key side by side with my 2019 map, and you'll see just how much more effort went into this year's project. Maybe too much effort. But, well, Rome wasn't built in a day, right? So without further ado, let's jump into it. And first, I'll unveil the key for the map, which unlike last year, had 175 different ethno-racial categories, with even more categories in earlier versions of said map, which you may or may not completely agree with, but I had my reasons for dividing up the human populace in such a manner, as I think it is consistent with self-identification based on phenotype, language, religion, culture, genetics, and historical identification. The point of this map is not so much to display the full mosaic of diversity of our species has to offer in a single picture, although that is quite interesting as well, but rather to tell a story, as every pixel tells a different tale of decades, if not centuries or millennia of migration, integration, and assimilation. And perhaps one of the most interesting continents of all is Africa, a place with extreme diversity that does not always get the attention it deserves in mainstream academia. This was the first and possibly easiest continent to finish, and probably one of my personal favorites as it's truly interesting to see the differences between different regions with Horn Africans, Nilotes, Khoisans, and other Africans having huge disparities in culture, physical appearance, and racial identity, with it being quite rare in the African continent today for Somalis, Igbo, or the Nuer to have some sort of racial solidarity. The northern end of the continent is dominated by Afro-Asiatic peoples, and I know the issue of North African identity is very, very complex, so instead of simply considering all Moroccan, Algerian, and Tunisian Arabic speakers to be Arabs in the same respect as Peninsular Arabs, I included them in their own category of Maghrebi, who have their own cultural, genetic, and historical distinctions from other Arabs. It should be noted that Sudanese have varying degrees of sub-Saharan admixture, however, regardless of appearance, many still identify with other Islamic states of the Middle East rather than sub-Saharan Africa. On the very southern tip of Africa, there are Cape Coloreds, a Creole group of highly diverse origin, along with small pockets of Indians, Anglo-South Africans, and the Afrikaners, a white ethnic group that has been in Africa for nearly as long as whites have been in the Americas. Other than this notable exception of Southern Africa, there are very few groups of non-Africans in other parts of the continent. Now, you'll notice that the borders among different ethnic groups in Europe is far more clear-cut and defined than those in the rest of the world, and this is a consequence of nation-states forming more organically rather than being arbitrarily defined. And although there were formerly large ethnic diasporas of different European ethnicities in different countries, in the past century mass migration and assimilation has largely homogenized most countries. Instead of conflating different European groups purely by ethno-linguistic categorization, I decided to narrow down even further somewhat by national geographic origin, for instance distinguishing between Italians, Frenchmen, and Romanians, as well as Germanic, Scandinavians, and Anglos, who are barely a Germanic group anyways. This doesn't entirely portray all the genetic and cultural differences between groups, as for example groups like the Italians and Greeks are a highly diverse population of various subgroups, but it does show the different clusters of ethnic identification. Similarly, in the Middle East, I distinguished further between the various ethno-racial categories I included last time, with different subsections of Arabs, divided between Peninsular and Levantine, and dividing Iranian groups between the Western Kurds and Lurs, Caspian groups in the north, Belush and Pashtuns in the east, and Persians proper, who actually barely maintain the majority in the country at 55-65%. to 65%. 
In the Gulf Arab states, there's obviously a huge, somewhat transient population of migrants from all over the world who make up solid majorities in these countries. And when it comes to Israel, it was very difficult to determine the placement of different Ashkenazi, Sephardi, and Mizrahi subdivisions of the country. So I simply grouped all Israeli Jews together. And this actually makes sense, as in Israel, these divisions are quickly being eroded as intermarriage is extremely common and a large proportion of Israeli Jews, especially the younger generation, has some degree of mixed heritage. In Russia and Central Asia, with all these being former constituents of the late Soviet Union, as I always mention, Joseph Stalin probably did more to shape the ethnic landscape of the world than any other single man in all of history. As although he was not always directly responsible for the mass deportations of the country, in various waves, Germans, Koreans, Jews, Mongols, and others were moved around the vast stretches of land for various reasons. This resulted in a strange patchwork of ethnic enclaves deep in the heart of Central Asia and Siberia, and even though Central Asia still retains its Turkic majority, in Siberia the vast majority of the population is of Slavic descent through migration and assimilation over the centuries, although there are still large pockets of the indigenous peoples in the more isolated regions and moderate ethnic diversity in most cities. In the Asiatic region consisting of East, South and Southeast Asia. Obviously, East and Southeast Asians are more closely related than South Asians, although culturally speaking, South Asians have had a huge impact on nearly all Southeast Asian groups over thousands of years. Take note that I have distinguished between Northern and Southern Han Chinese subgroups, along with the Gargantian Han Diaspora in Southeast Asia, who for all intents are quite different populations, and I also made distinctions between a few different groups in the Tibeto-Burman, Austronesian, and Austroasiatic peoples, as the distinction between groups like the Khmer and Vietnamese, Filipinos and Indonesians, or Tibetans and Burmese, are simply too large to group together. You'll notice that although there are moderate minorities of Tibeto-Burman groups on the fringes of the Indian subcontinent, for the most part, the reverse is not true, with a South Asian present nearly absent from China, and there are various reasons for this one-way migration. One major exception to this would be the large Tamil and other South Asian communities of Singapore and Malaysia, who are mostly recent arrivals from the British period, with many Chinese immigrants coming to the region during this period as well, although there have been significant Han minorities there since antiquity. In Oceania, the mainlands of Australia and New Zealand are clearly dominated by those of Anglo descent, although the extent of which Anglo-Australians and New Zealanders are related to Englishmen of the British Isles is debatable, as there are also clearly large Celtic minorities in both these countries, along with the indigenous inhabitants, Aboriginals and Maori respectively, and of course large pockets of Asian migrants in large cities. And I thoroughly enjoyed how this section turned out, and even though they might seem small and insignificant, there are many interesting quirks of migration on some of the various islands such as New Caledonia or Fiji. Moving on to the Americas, just as last year, Latin America proved to be incredibly satisfying to finish, although the color scheme was... I don't know, a bit ugly perhaps? I really wish there were some better colors to use other than a dull gray to represent the various multiracial populations such as the Mestizos and Pardos, and I might change it in the future. Now, because of the enormous area and distances in Latin America and extremely divergent histories of many of these countries, I distinguish between mestizos from Mexico and Central America, mestizos from South America, Paraguayan or Guarani-speaking mestizos, and mestizos from Patagonia of partial Fuegian, Croatian, and Italian heritage, and I distinguish between self-identified white Latinos from Brazil and mainland Hispanic America and the Caribbean, as it cannot be said with any degree of accuracy that these groups share too much in the way of a common gene pool or heritage as these groups are derived from different regions of Iberia and the Americas. I suppose if there were one thing I could revisit and improve upon, it would be my classification of native Amerindian groups. However, considering that many Amerindians are very poorly attested and studied even to the present day, doing that with any degree of accuracy would be difficult. Northern America was the home stretch possibly because it was the most daunting to complete, and in adding the additional ethno-racial categorizations to this region results in the extreme ethnic hyper-diversity seen here, more so than any other region, possibly only challenged by Brazil. 
Now, if you're curious, I did indeed count Mormons as a separate ethno-religious categorization from Anglo-Americans or English, as the majority of the Mormon community of the Western states are a tight-knit group that has somewhat become a homogenized, cohesive population with a separate identity, and hence many consider old-stock, non-convert Mormons to functionally act as an ethnicity in their own right, as I discussed in the past, and stitching all the puzzle pieces together results in what I would consider to be my crowning achievement. And although the color scheme probably could use some work, I truly found this to be a fun and rewarding project. So am I obsessed with the division of the human species? Eh, maybe. I've always had a deep fascination with other cultures, countries, and religions, most likely because of my own unique heritage with my dad being German and Celtic and my mom being Iranian and Black American. But even though I've been studying anthropology for years on my own, I never really had a chance to share it with anyone. And hence, I owe you all a heartfelt thank you for blessing me beyond my wildest dreams. Just on my part alone of congregating resources and research, Hundreds of hours were poured into this project, not to mention the thousands more put in by others through first-hand sources, which I can't stress my appreciation for enough. As I mentioned last year, there's a ton of conflicting information out there, and hence the map maybe isn't 100% accurate yet, as no map can ever be 100% accurate, but I'm going to continue to work, improving, and adding more detail. This is the reason I haven't uploaded in the past few weeks, as I didn't want to work on anything else until it was completely finished, although I do have nearly a dozen partially finished scripts and videos I've started on, so the videos will resume as scheduled very shortly. Consider this my quarter of a million subscriber special, and thank you all for your support. Download link for the full map in the description, and for today's poll, tell me which region of the map you found to be the most interesting. And as always, thank you all so much for watching, this has been Mason, and I'll see you next time.